Welcome to the Heartland Cycling Network. We're going to be talking uh, with Todd Kay this evening, uh, who happens to be the service manager at Green Street Cycles, and he's going to be covering the ABCs of bike maintenance. And this uh, particular show happens to be on brakes, uh, the different kinds of brakes, how you should adjust them, different things that he can help you with that you can actually do on your own. But one of the things that's really great about you know stores, uh, local bike shops like Green Street and the other ones that are around in the metro area is that they all tend to offer these kind of clinics and workshops absolutely free of charge. You can just go into their uh, shop and look uh, when they're going to actually have one and uh, be part of the audience and uh, participate and be able to ask questions. So. Uh, Here's Todd K talking about brakes. Uh, this particular bike um, has what's called, uh, we have hydraulic disc brakes on this particular bike. Your classic type of bike is going to have the regular rim brake, which actually when you pull the lever, it's going to pinch the side of the rim, which causes the friction to slow you down. This has a disc brake. In this case, it's a hydraulic disc brake. So it's basically a small version of what's on your car. There is a fluid in here, it's an oil. Um, some will have a mineral oil and some will have a dot fluid. These have a very, very nice smooth pull to the lever. Um, and with braking performance, like you can't get anything better than a hydraulic disc brake. Uh, it is highly recommended, but that's not to say that a regular rim brake is bad. Where the regular rim brakes kind of are not on the same level is in wet conditions. So if you are riding in say a misty rain or ride through a puddle and your brake surface gets wet, when you go to squeeze that lever, there's going to be a slipping first and a drying off of that rim before it starts to get friction. Um, you will have braking power, it will just be minimized. With this, and th this originally started in kind of the mountain bike side of things, because you are more apt to get in um, any wet or muddy conditions. With this, you will always have braking power. You can basically ride through a puddle up to here and you will always have braking power. Um, maintenance on these, uh, does anybody out there have a bike with disc brakes? There's two types of disc brakes. Um, yes, so the, yours has hydraulic disc. The other is gonna be the mechanical or cable pull, um, which are really good too. Uh, those types of brakes are great. Yes, sir. When you have those um, brakes to squeeze them on your tire, do you know why mine are like really, really hard to pull? It could be, um, the, there could be a lot of reasons for that. <coughs> so it could be the cable system. Um, basically, when we have, it's called a mechanical system. When you, when you pull the lever, it pulls a cable and then pulls the, on the caliper to create friction. The cable could be rusty. The, ca the inside of that outer cable can have some dirt or dust in there that can cause friction. Um, it's all a matter of kind of taking it apart and figuring out what it is. Um, the cable itself might be broken. That could be another thing. I saw that today on a bike, which we're gonna be fixing. Um, but the first and foremost thing is yes. How do you take apart the cable? So now that's going to be a whole nother type of class that I think we're going to do. Uh, to actually break down um, a brake system, um, I've actually been thinking about doing an, uh, a workshop instead of more of an observational type class where we have five bike stands back here in our service area, including my travel one, um, so that I can actually show you guys how to do it and you guys can bring in your own bikes and do it yourself. So uh, it's just, I thought of that today uh, because I kind of compare this uh, doing the observational thing to like YouTube. You can watch YouTube all you want, but you don't have somebody over your shoulder to say, no, maybe try it this way, you know? Um, so I think the next thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna propose a, a workshop type class and we'll show you guys how to do brakes and gears and that kind of thing. Um, 
But first and foremost, you want to be able to know how to check the wear on your brake pads. Uh, in this case, I, I got another bike over here and I could show you. So this bike um, is the entry level version of this bike. This is, has your classic rim brake. This type of brake is called the V brake. If you see how they work, these two arms, when they pivot, they work in a V. And this has the rubberized brake pads that touch the rim surface. Here is where you can feel, and you dig your fingernail in uh, to feel and make sure it's supple and still feeling great. You should feel that suppleness uh, knowing that it's not gonna dry rot. But the brake pads themselves, even during the molding process, will have a line on it. That is basically the wear line. When you see the material getting closer and closer to the wear line, and I'll leave this out so you guys can take a look, um, that means your brake pad is starting to wear down. Um, especially if it's worn down, and I've seen it too on some bikes, right down to the metal mount that's kind of buried inside the brake pad. So that's how you know you definitely need new brake pads. These are relatively easy to change um, and not even that expensive. Brake pads are only about nine bucks. Um, and in the workshop, we can show you how to do that. One of the most common things too is brake squeaking uh, that we can talk about. So that's basically when there is a kind of a foreign material maybe on the brake pad or the rim brake surface itself, that's causing um, something to vibrate. And there's a whole number of things that you can do. You can remove the brake pad and just sand it off. It is probably dirt because as you squeeze and ride your bike more and more, uh, kind of a clear film builds up on the surface of the brake pad. That could be causing it. Same thing with these type of brakes, hydraulic disc brake pads. It's a little bit more involved to remove those. If you're gonna remove your brake pads from a disc brake, it's a little bit more involved. You wanna be very, very careful doing that. Um, but it's the same basic thing. If there's like a, a foreign film or contaminant on your brake pads, uh, that could be causing the squeezing as well, uh, squeaking. The one thing a rider has to be careful of if you have any type of disc brake system is you cannot get any oil or any type of foreign contaminant on the rotor and or pads. Uh, I had a gentleman buy a, a very nice bike, uh, same bike as that, um, and he rode through a puddle not realizing there was oil in the puddle and it got all over his brake pads and rotors and he needed new brake pads and rotors. Because uh, that, that oil will get embedded and kind of absorbed into the brake pad material and they will not work. They will constantly squeak um, and they, they just won't work properly. Any questions on brakes so far? Yes, sir. Why were brakes invented? So we don't crash into like other people, uh, cars, you know, so we can slow down. Oh, like kind of like a Fred Flintstone thing. So wear up your shoes. Yeah, because I, I kind of like my shoes. Yes. Do they rate the cable like for how how often you should have cables replaced mm -hmm. before when it turns? No, cables will stretch naturally. To my knowledge, there is no rating on them, okay. um, but they will stretch. That is perfectly like nature of the beast. So with these, these are cable actuated, and I always set up the brakes so that when you pull them and you and where they grab right here because you could squeeze them more um, they grab it about a third of the way when they start to grab closer to the grip that's how you know when it's gonna it's stretching so on these types of brakes there's called uh, adjusting barrels this is the barrel right here as it stretches naturally and they set this up so that you can do this even while you're riding um, you can turn the barrel out to put more tension on the cable, and now your lever is gonna squeeze a little bit better. Um, then there is a lock nut where you just turn that in. And once you find your spot, you lock it in place and it's not gonna move on you. Um, same thing with uh, derailers. If it's a cable actuated derailleur, cables do stretch no matter what. Um, it is really uh, 
up to you if, if it, the cable will stretch and stretch and stretch when to change it. As long as the cable is in good condition, like where it gets pinched right here. Um, if uh, I've seen it, even seen it on new builds when we can't get it adjusted just right. If you pinched this more and often, um, it'll start to fray. That's when, it's, as soon as you see a, a frayed cable, you should change it right away because it it's only going to get worse. Uh, and that will seriously affect your braking. Um, with these guys, it's just uh, fluid. Now, we've had a common question with these. Um, these can be bled. Pretty much all brake manufacturers recommend bleeding their brakes once a year. But it also, to me, it also depends on how often you ride. Uh, I mean, if you only ride your bike twice a year, then you're not, you're not gonna have to do that. Um, if you ride frequently, I, I'd say on average, two to five times a week, yes, you should definitely do that um, and bleed it once a year. But these, these systems are pretty much bulletproof. Uh, unless there's a catastrophic failure or something gets pulled out, you don't have to worry about these at all. These are actually designed so that as the brake pad uh, wears down naturally, the lever pull is gonna always be the same. So that's, you just have to just keep aware, uh, be aware of and check your brake pad thicknesses. That's all. The, uh, you can, on some brakes, you can see them easily. Sometimes you just gotta use a flashlight, but you should always be able to just take a look and see what they look like brand new and then you'll know it uh, as they wear and break down. Any, any other questions? Yes? On this brakes, is the brake pad rubber or is it metal like a car? There are three, basic same idea as a, as a car. There are three basic materials. Same thing with brake rotors. So whatever material your ro uh, brake pads are, the rotor needs to match. Needs to match. Yes, yes. Um, when it comes down to it, if you were getting new brake pads on your disc brakes, I would also recommend new rotors uh, because they will, as things wear, we like to use the term, they marry. So if you had really, really worn brake pads, that means your rotor's worn maybe, um, and putting new brake pads on a worn rotor is just not gonna work efficiently. Any other questions about brake stall? Yes. The first bikes were really, I think in the mid 1800s, um, yes. Is it easy to switch the different types of brakes? There are going to be, like this particular bike, it's going to depend on the bike. Um, with, if you look at this bike to this bike, now it's, this is the Cirrus 1.0, this is the Cirrus 2.0. If you can do upgrades to any bike, but you want to make sure that it can actually physically, mechanically can be done. If I wanted to put disc brakes on this, I can't because the way these brakes mount to the fork itself. There are no, place, no places to mount the, for, uh, the brake caliper on this. And same thing with the rear of the frame. Even if you wanted to weld them on, you wouldn't recommend? Well, I would ne never ever recommend doing that. The first thing what would happen is you void the warranty. That, that's the first thing that would happen. Um, the, that goes along the lines of when we're helping people purchase a bike, if there is a feature that you want on a bike, get the bike with it. Because this is a really good example, like if you wanted disc brakes, um, you can't do it. Uh, it's just much easier to get the bike with it. There's a lot of different components along that same line. If you want, the, if you want a certain component, get the bike with it, it's way easier. It, if you're going to switch out rims and tires, the limitations are going to be the width right here. So if we look at just tires, um, we can put on much, much wider tires than this, but will it fit in the fork and in the frame? Um, the same thing with the rims too, there's going to be a certain width and it just depends on what you would want to put on and we would check out the limitations that way. But yeah, you can go with yeah, that particular setup. Any, yes? So you can just switch out the force for a brake upgrade? 
In this case, if you wanted, you could switch out the fork, but there's nothing on the rear where you can mount the rear brake to. It would also be a, a wheel upgrade too, because if you look at, now the wheel being this, this is a tire, this is the wheel. The, the rotor itself is mounted to a flange that's on the hub. So you'd have to get new wheels too. So depending on the wheel set, so if you, this wheel set alone is probably at least 150 to 200 bucks. Then you have to get the brakes. Then you have to get the levers. Then you have to have it installed. So it adds up quickly if you wanted to do an upgrade. Now, if you had this bike and you wanted to upgrade to the next level or very higher level set of brakes, it's easier to do. It's going from a bike that's not set up for it to a bike that already has it. That's where the differences are. Yeah, a lot of technical stuff. We even get um, questions on a bike like this. This is your basic hybrid. It's basically the most common type of bike out there right now. Can you put a drop bar in this? Now, there's many reasons why I don't recommend it, but it can be done, absolutely. Um, drop bar meaning those curl down bars, uh, classic road bike. Now, the hybrid itself is meant for a certain type of riding. The drop bar bike is meant for something completely different. So if you got them installed on here, it's not gonna ride the same as a true drop bar bike. The other thing is the levers. So the levers on those bikes is probably one of the most expensive components where just the levers alone can it be anywhere from 250 to 500 bucks uh, for an entry set of levers. Then you still gotta install everything. Um, it, yes, it can be done, but it's, it can be quite expensive. Any, uh, any other questions on brakes? Moving on to our last part of the basics is what we call the C or chain or drivetrain. That's going to consist of, let me swing this out a little bit more. You are, this, these are what's called your cranks. Obviously your chain, your rear set of gears, the gear cluster is called either a cassette or a freewheel, and your front and rear derailleurs. Um, probably the most common question I'm asked about a drivetrain system is how often to clean it. And that is really, how, based on how often you ride. So, and where, where you ride. So has anybody ridden or seen the Wabash uh, Trace? Uh, used to be a railroad track, um, so it's all that crushed limestone stuff, but it, it can get very, very dusty. These chains, uh, even brand new, already have a lube on it, so that can attract quite a, a bit of dust. And as that dust builds up, it can actually act as an abrasive uh, in here and wear down the chain faster. The other thing that happens is when we are riding, we're pushing these, this back wheel as we pedal. We're pushing that with our biggest muscle groups, our quads. So as we put pressure on this, this chain actually wears over time and we call it chain stretch because the way it wears, it'll lengthen the chain um, and put more distance on these links which will eventually wear down this gear cluster. So when your chain stretches, it will start to affect your shifting. It's not gonna be as precise. Uh, and it, the wearing of these is critical too. This is um, another time where we call the wearing of this system when it marries. So in this case too, we also wanna be aware of cable stretch on your shifting or your derailleurs. Basically, um, pretty much everybody has a, a multi-speed system. Uh, when we change the gear, what you're doing is you're changing the resistance in pedaling. And basically, when your gearing is in the biggest in the front and smallest in the back, that is your highest resistance. When we are in the smallest in the front and biggest in the back, that is your easiest resistance, like say hill climbing. Uh, and then you have kind of a, every kind of gear spread in between. Uh, nobody does, if, uh, if somebody has some older bikes, uh, they might have three gears up front. Nobody really does that anymore. Uh, it's, uh, we, it's two speeds or even one. Uh, that this drop bar bike right here has just uh, a single speed up front. 
these gears, this system isn't referred to as like a 10 speed or an 18 speed anymore. Um, it's referred to how many, however many gears you have in the front by however many gears you have in the back. So this is a two by eight system. Uh, it's a very, very good uh, gear spread for this type of riding. So one thing um, about cleaning this chain is you can do it regularly, easily, by if you don't have a stand like this, you can lean it up against the wall. You can take a rag and just simply hold the rag on the chain and pedal backwards and clean it off. Uh, or if you have something like this where we put uh, a cleaning fluid in it, this clips over the chain and it's, uh, it scrubs the chain, uh, especially if you uh, ride in mostly dusty areas. This will do a really great job of cleaning the chain off and getting into all of these little rollers and pins. The key then too is then to lube the chain afterwards. Uh, if you use a lot of fluid to clean it off, you want to dry it off pretty good. Uh, my trick to using the uh, chain lube, you definitely want to use a chain specific lube. I had a gentleman asking me if he could use WD-40. I said no. Uh, WD-40 is like a degreaser. Uh, it is not a lubrication. It's like a magnet for dust. Oh yeah. So you definitely always want to use a chain specific lube. We use this uh, Dumond Tech, uh, and this is what we use for our services. The, uh, the little bit thicker. My trick is I'll try to do this so everybody can see. Um, I like to put it in a mid gear where I can drip it on easily. And all I'll do is just spin the pedals and just drip it on the chain just like that. Go a couple times around making sure I get kind of full coverage right on the rollers. Then just go through the gears one at a time. And helps. Now they'll need a stand, right? Sorry? Now they'll need a stand. Now you'll need a stand. Yeah. So it's always easiest uh, to work on your bike. If you like to do your DIY stuff at home, it's always easiest to do and have one of these um, uh, at home work stands. This is actually my travel stand that I use for myself and uh, my race team uh, because I do not like to bend over and work on a bike. Uh, working in a shop also spoils us. So it's great to be nicely in this position when you're working on a bike. Um, the uh, only really, when you guys are out there shifting um, a bike, I get asked a lot about what gear should I be in and whatever particular time when you're riding. There is no rule that says you have to be in X gear if you're going up this hill. Because if you and I were riding the same bike up the same hill at the same time, I'm going to pick a different gear than you just to make it easier for myself. And that's fine. The only solid rule is that you just have to be pedaling while you do it so that it, it shifts properly. That's really it. Uh, any questions so far on gearing gear ratios? It, this, this part right here can get super complicated, but I always like to keep everything nice and simple. Uh, any, any questions at all? No, no questions. Man, you guys are hired. I got a question. Yeah. I just got a brand new chain in my it's when I whenever I hit gravel now, it's coming off my rear my rear derailleur. It's coming off your rear derailleur? Yeah. Anytime I hit uh, like a big bump, okay. the chain comes off my rear derailleur. Um is the chain the correct length? Yep. Okay. Uh, I would check see to see if this is starting to loosen up. Is it an older bike? Oh, uh, it's my 2019. Okay. Um, first thing I would check is if it's the proper length. Um, there are many, many different ways. If you're going to install a chain, um, to have it the correct length. And everybody, I know one of our experienced guys uh, does it a completely different way than I do. And I don't even understand how he does it, but he gets it perfect every time. Um, when you're installing a new chain, basically what I look at, you, you always put the chain in what I call small, small. That is where both of your derailleurs are in the least amount of tension. Um, and I 
set it up so that the derailleur is in this position, the rear derailleur. Pretty much parallel to the ground, as parallel as it can be. Because when you're into the biggest gear, when you are in big, big, this is called cross chaining. And if the chain, if the chain was too short, it would go like this. Well, yeah. I mean, I did have another shop that, that did it, put it on, ordered the chain for long, so. Right. But it's like I said, it's only when I hit a hard bump that it, it's well, kicking it right off. These things, there is a lot of bounce. These things bounce right. a lot. Um, some of the new ones uh, have what's called a clutch on it. And it's just a switch to stiffen out this spring <clears throat> um, and minimizes what's called chain slap, the bounce. Um, but it doesn't affect, you can't even tell by pressing the button if it's on or not. <clears throat> so, but you'll see them a lot on mountain bikes. You'll see them a lot on gra newer gravel bikes too. Um, the clutch thing is a great little addition to a derailleur. So we want to kind of see what's going on with it and then make that kind of diagnosis if that's what you need. When did the technology come out for this switch? That clutch? Yeah. Um, relatively new, I'd say about maybe five years ago. Yeah. Uh, most derailers have them. I know SRAM, newer SRAM is built in because this spring, this part of the spring right here is pretty stiff. Um, Shimano ones will have a switch like this. Uh, this, this particular brand, Microshift, on some of the higher ends have just a little flip of the switch right here on the side. Um, and it minimizes that. Any uh, other questions at all? Well, I guess we can call that an evening uh, if you guys don't have any other questions. Okay, thank you for watching uh, the Heartland Cycling Network this evening. And uh, just want to remind everybody to pedal on.